The following presentation is a delayed broadcast by means of videotape. This is a freshwater marsh, a place where water from rivers and lakes is stored when there's too much, and a place it comes from when there's not enough. The marsh is also a combined aquatic supermarket and kidney, its tiny creatures purifying the waters as they feed on microscopic life. It is a place of shelter for small fish hiding from larger enemies. It is a place of renewal. A place of birth. It is also a place of swift and violent death. Here then in microcosm is the endless struggle for existence which we call the balance of nature. Increasingly this ancient balance is being upset by that most heedless and dangerous of all animals, man. Stuck for a way of getting his refuse out of sight and out of mind, he dumps it into whatever river, lake, or stream happens to be at hand. Actually, he isn't doing anything he hasn't always done. He's just doing more of it. The theory, if not the fact, used to be that the supply of water was almost inexhaustible, and its capacity to cleanse just about infinite. Whatever went into the water seemed to disappear downstream forever. When there was a lot of fresh water no one needed, and there weren't so many people and so much industry, it all seemed to work. It doesn't anymore. Buffalo, New York, near the mouth of Lake Erie, is a good example. It depends on the lake for its livelihood and its drinking water. They haven't always mixed. Heavy industry and urban sewage have seriously damaged the lake and the adjacent Buffalo River. Dr. Robert Sweeney is a scientist working at the Great Lakes Laboratory. The lab is devoted to applied research and education in the field of water pollution. Dr. Sweeney thinks a good part of the present problem is avoidable. The problem with pollution, one well, of the real crimes of pollution, is that we have the technology to clean up the problem. It's a matter of we're not applying it. We do have the design, satisfactory designs of sewage treatment plants that will do the job. Right now, the, we're, this area and most of the Great Lakes Basin is served by what is known as primary sewage treatment plants, where the sewage is just strained and allowed to settle. And this removes about 20% of the pollutants. What we need to do is upgrade these, put in other steps, namely a biological step, which would remove an additional 75% of the pollutants, and then a tertiary step, a chemical step, that would remove some of the 
chemicals, particularly phosphates, which stimulate the overgrowth of algae, which in turn causes other problems. And when algae reach a certain population density or degree of crowdedness, the algae self-destructs, poisons itself in its own effluent, settles to the bottom of the lake, like Lake Erie, and there it decays. And in the decaying process, oxygen is used up. The oxygen becomes insufficient for the fish and other forms of life in the lake, and they die, and they start to decay. And this vicious cycle is perpetuated. So we have to break the cycle by cutting down on the nutrients, namely the sewage, that we are putting in the lakes in excess in order to break this undesirable eutrophication cycle. So if we're able to cut down on the amount of phosphorus going into our lakes, we can cut down on the algae growth. Now, phosphate detergents account for about half the phosphorus going into our waters. We're still going to need to build the sewage treatment plants to clean up the phosphorus. However, by removing the phosphates from the detergents, we may be able to buy some time. A typical attempt to buy time has been a large-scale effort to replace detergent phosphates with a chemical, commonly called NTA. The results have been controversial. For one thing, NTA is known to encourage large concentrations of mercury. Nobody knows exactly what percentage of mercury in the human body is tolerable, but we do know its effects can be catastrophic. In the 1950s, scores of people suffered severe nerve damage by eating fish from Japan's Minamata Bay. More recently, a mercury scare developed on the Great Lakes. Some think the Canadians are better at meeting such emergencies, even though they produce less pollution than Americans in the region. Pollution is directly proportional to population, and there's more Americans living around the Great Lakes than there are Canadians. Now, the Canadians have consolidated their pollution abatement efforts into largely one agency or at one location. On the United States side, I think there are 65 or 67 different federal agencies, not counting state agencies, that are involved in pollution abatement. Some of these agencies are going their own way, and there's a lack of communication and coordination on the American side. Also, some of the decisions made on the American side with regards to pollution, I think, are more politically based than environmentally based. Whereas on the Canadian side, they have agreed, for the most part, to remove politics from pollution. This is the Canadian side of the Great Lakes, not the American. It's getting harder to tell the difference all the time. Canadian cities along the shore are beginning to match their American neighbors across the water in population and pollution. More wealth and more leisure are creating a demand for recreational areas, but these are disappearing because of industrial growth on the water. Does Canada do a better job than the United States in controlling water pollution? Joe Montgomery, an officer of the Niagara Falls, Ontario Chamber of Commerce, speaks of one approach the Canadians have used. In the province of Ontario, in 1955, when the Ontario Water Resources Commission was set up, they set up river controls. Now, some of the rivers, such as the Grand River uh, Conservation Authority, has complete control over approximately 100 miles of river. They didn't have to worry about going to this community and that community and the other community. They had complete control of the entire river and all its tributaries. They were then able to look at it as a whole problem, problem, not as a bunch of separate problems, but an overall problem. And they were then able to put priority lists on areas where correction was needed first. And then as these hot spots were corrected, then they were able to get at the lower spots. And finally, we have the entire river cleaned up. 
industry reaction in Canada has been one, I think, of responsibility. They realize that they have a serious problem and they are on a period of correction. But like a lot of other things, if it is done on an industry-wide basis, the firms cannot move to another area to set up in areas where there are no pollution controls. If it is done to all types of manufacturing firms at the same time so that there is no economic advantage accruing to one industry over another industry, then I think they accept the fact. And I think that many manufacturing firms are finding a profit in their pollution control through the saving of money that was going up the smokestack in, in waste material. The Ontario formula could be valuable to all industrialized nations. But what about the developing ones? While pushing hard to match technologically advanced competitors, can they afford the cost of avoiding future water pollution problems? Joe Montgomery. Developing nations are, of course, offering incentives for industry. And I think that if they pay attention to the mistakes that have been made in Europe, on the North American continent, in the, in the built-up areas, I think they will be able to save themselves a lot of trouble, a lot of expense, and a lot of worry. And I certainly hope that international agencies will work very hard to make certain that the necessary pollution controls are put in as a part of the program whenever the World Bank or any other world agency is used to help a developing country develop. water has been scarce and precious in many parts of the world. Even when available, man and beast have toiled endlessly to claim it. Increasingly, the burden is lifting, and a dream is taking its place. That dream is water power, and the industrialization to provide the necessities even the luxuries of life as the industrialized nations know them. But can this dream backfire?
Taming uncontrolled water and putting it to work has been a mixed blessing for many of the developing nations. New dams on the Nile, Zambezi, and Volta rivers have provided power, flood control, and irrigation. In the process, they've also sometimes damaged wildlife, changed water temperatures, disrupted life patterns, and produced new threats to health. Without planning, the great waters of the developing world might someday face problems not unlike those of New York's Hudson River. Fred Danback of Yonkers is one private citizen who is saddened by what's happened to the river. I love this river. I, I really love it. I enjoyed many hours along this river. And every night when I go home and I see my two sons, and I feel I can't go down here now because there's nothing for them, I keep asking myself why. I became very well associated with the commercial fishermen that used the Hudson River. I've watched their industry giant their industry die because of pollution. I've watched swimming stop in a river because of pollution. And I'm now watching my children grow up. And uh, I feel that they're going to be deprived of the river as I knew it. Danback has done a lot more than just lament the passing of the Hudson's better days. He's provided the main ammunition for many groups battling to save the river. Rummaging through some old archives, he unearthed the New York Harbor Act of 1888 and the Federal Refuse Act of 1899. Though long forgotten, they were still in force, and they laid down fines for anyone depositing wastes of any kind in navigable waters. To Fred Danback, that meant his employer, Anaconda Wire and Cable, should be convicted of chemical pollution. It all happened by constant complaints to all government agencies, the Army Corps of Engineers, environmental control direct, uh, and directors, uh, the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Army, you name it, and I guess we complained to them. And nothing seemed to be materializing from these complaints. Oh, yes, we've had inspectors come up on lots of occasions. They came into the plant, checked over the complaint, found the violation, and nothing happened. Finally, one day, I heard about the Hudson River Fishermen's Association. I received an application from them, joined the organization, and together we were finally able to get results against Anaconda. That took 18 years to do. Because, as he puts it, his time is eventually going to run out. Danback hopes future victories will not take 18 years. Yet, since Anaconda is by no means the only polluter on the Hudson, his fight for the river is far from over. He recently took our camera crew on a trip to show how bad things still are. One of the things we found today, which is very disgusting, we went out along this tributary of <coughs> Sawmill River Creek, which flows into the Hudson here. We visited junkyards. One junkyard which we visited had abandoned cars in the uh, Sawmill River Creek all kinds of debris rolling down its banks, and even a possibility that someday this bank may collapse and completely dam up the creek at one point. Further down, we came to the city incinerator, where an untold amount of debris was going into the Sormer River Creek from the incineration plant, while smoke poured from its chimneys flew in the air. Further down, we ran into another company, which had debris in the water, and its banks was littered with garbage. All the way through the entire Sormo River Creek area that we covered today, you could see the sickening mess. You wonder why it exists, why the literal law pertaining to the Refuse Act isn't enforced. I wonder why the commissioners and responsible people in the municipalities are not enforcing these laws. It can be done. There's no reason why it can't be. Journalist Bob Boyle is a prominent member of the Hudson River Fishermen's Association. He, too, is angry about the way anti-pollution laws are ignored. These polluters are committing acts against the law. And at a time when uh, the cry is for law and order, I don't see where huge corporations can say, look at that hippie over there smoking pot, lock him up, while uh, they're defecating into uh, ecosystems. It's just not fair. One day in 1967, 
I went down to the Corps of Engineers headquarters in New York and I said, why the hell don't you lock these people up, find them or bring them to trial, whatever you're supposed to do. And a Corps official, a civilian, said to me, oh, we're dealing with top officials in industry, or top people in this industry, and you don't go around treating these people like that. Well, I believe in equality before the law, and I think this is so much nonsense, and I told him so. Perhaps the most corrosive thing about seeing government officials look the other way when a, an influential polluter is allowed to violate the law is the acid effect it has on democracy in this country. People then begin to think that the system really stinks, that one can rig it, that one can fix it, or that one has no hope as a small individual. And I think that is deplorable, and we are not going to let that happen. We have had laws on the books since the 19th century in this country that can deal with pollution menace that we have today in our waters. We don't really need any new laws. The only difficulty is, is getting the laws enforced. Anyone who sees something going on that's wrong should be able to complain to proper authorities about it and get correction. You'd practically have to live next door to the polluter in order to be able to complain. Well, should we change robbery laws? If, for example, I saw a bandit running out of the Chase Manhattan Bank with $500,000 in gold, and I went up to a policeman and I saw, I just saw a bandit leaving the Chase Manhattan Bank with $500,000 in gold. And he said, well, that's very interesting. Are you a depositor there? And I'd say, no, I happen to be at the manufacturer's Hanover Trust. He'd say, sorry, you don't have a direct interest uh, in this matter. Uh, so I think making people have a direct interest in the matter, that is, having to live downstream of the polluter, is absolutely ridiculous. Because pollutants just don't stay in place and they just don't go downstream. In the Hudson, they happen to go upstream. <coughs> and furthermore, once you release a pollutant into the waters of the Hudson River or the Mississippi uh, or Lake St. Clair or Lake Superior or the Columbia River, uh, they just don't stay in those river systems. They enter into uh, the hydrologic cycle. Uh, they go all over the earth. They go all over the northern hemisphere. We're making all sorts of synthetic chemical bonds that really can't be readily broken down in nature. And aside from wrapping our bread better, packaging television sets. We have no idea whatever what happens to them when they decompose or they're thrown into a garbage dump. Things don't stay in place in nature, they move. And this we have to realize. The man who divorces himself from nature is a fool because he's part of nature. And anyone who thinks that he's part of the plastic wrapped, plastic civilization that he surrounds himself with today and that and that alone is, is a damn fool. Someone who says, so what if we lose seven species of birds? It's like someone saying, so what if I lost seven of my toes? I've got three more. If something affects nature, it affects him, and man has to realize that he is part of nature, and he has to be concerned about what is happening there.